Okay, well, good evening. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to all of you again. My name is Leslie Pickle, and I'm the Managing Director of the Urban Guild, and it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Um, what we're going to do tonight basically came out, this idea came out of a post recently on the Guild Forum about sharing techniques around how to design livable spaces within the roof forms of one and a half story houses. I believe I have that correct, says the non-architect in the room. And I'm delighted to have two of our Guild board members joining us. Um, many of you may be aware that we've had a, a few folks that have come in and out on this um, kind of what I'm calling pop-up Guild Design Hour. And so I'm pleased to uh, welcome and thanks to Eric Moser of Moser Design Group and Gary Brewer of Robert A.M. Stern Architects. And they are going to, I believe Eric is going to be first and he's going to share his screen and share with you all. And um, if you'd like, we can have some Q&A after that or we can hold questions till the end and have Gary's presentation next. Um, and I'm here to offer tech support and be with them. I think uh, to offer support, a couple of things we would just say, as all of you know, I know you're Zoom aficionados at this point, but um, we just invite you to use the speaker view uh, to see things more clearly and for everyone to be on mute as we get started. And you're welcome to, of course, turn your videos off if you like. Um, and with that, Eric, I think if you're ready, we will go ahead and get started. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It's good to see all of your faces. I know many of you, if not all. Um, let me do my little techno thing here, our broadcast. Now I've got to get to the right spot. All right, do you all see vertical circulation strategies for one and a half story houses? Yes. Oh, good. All right, we're on the way. Um, so this is interesting. You know, I, I think that all of us do this quite often. Um, so there are you know, lots of different strategies. So when Gary and uh, a few of the other board members talked about this presentation, I thought, what is it that we could share that would be of interest and maybe of, of usefulness? And as a, a crew that concentrates on smaller houses, uh, one of the things that you know, I think always becomes an issue is you know, how do you get up there in the first place? So particularly when you design things that are you know, often one room deep and you know, we, we concentrate on trying, you know, we design kind of by this cubic foot. So, um, I like to minimize as much attic space as we possibly can as, as I do when we look at um, you know, our design. So you know, I thought the stairs, the stairs is what we struggle with a lot. You know, how do you do that well? And how do you do that without compromising uh, the areas above? So uh, what I'm going to share with you this afternoon and this evening are three different strategies for very narrow buildings uh, to, uh, uh, to gain access to this to a second floor or, or an attic space and, um, and also leave enough up there to use. So clearly uh, this first slide is three strategies which is a front facing, uh, which means that it's kind of a stair that's embedded within the, the primary form, primary mass, um, but actually working not at, an, at, you know, what is generally a gable end, but actually on a, uh, what is normally a, an eave front. Um, the second is the stair that's set aside, stair tower or a stair form or stair hall outside of the primary form. And then the third, which is the easiest one in a way, is that stair that kind of rises at that uh, at one end or the other of the primary form, the, the narrow end of the primary form. Uh, so you can work within the, you know, within the gable. But even then, when you're talking about a narrow form or a narrow mass, 
you have you, you get the challenge of well I can get up there but I also have to have head height in order to uh, to get that straight turned and to make sure that I don't have a dormer right on the edge of my my building form which is kind of like silly all right so all of those little little pieces that we look at and try to solve as we go as we as we um, design story and a half houses or to or access the uh, the areas of of our of our roof forms so the first uh solution i'll show you and again i am talking about small this is a 700 square foot building and i do apologize the jets are flying around here so i hope that uh, they won't make too much of a nuisance but in a, you know, here's an op one of the examples where we have a uh, stair that rises uh, in the middle of a form along the eave line. In other words, along the knee wall edge of the, the primary form. So as you climb up, there are very few solutions without make, that will allow you to get up there without making just a really ugly bulbous thing on the, on the roof. So in this case, uh, we rise up and we use it simple shed dormer that uh, allows the stair to rise and you know get that dormer wide enough and placed in a, in a um, uh, an effective location where you've got clear head height at the as the riser as the stairs go up and um, you know and then clearly you know plenty of light and, and, and head height as, as you rise to the top um, so as you can see here as a matter of fact I'll Use my little trusty piece. You know, as you see, see, you see, as we rise to the top of the stair, you've got the light up there. It's a great and welcoming and wonderful kind of experience. But still, you'll notice that in the next photo, this is at the top of the stairs where we still have to turn back and get under the the principal the principal gable. Um, you know, very simple building section. Uh, uh, here, which kind of shows how that stair works in both both uh, conditions and kind of how those small spaces feel up top and how you can kind of get creative, particularly with small spaces making more of lofts as opposed to um, more traditional enclosed rooms. Uh, the example or photograph to the right kind of kind of looks at how you can take advantage of these low areas and stay within the building code for portions of bathrooms and other usable spaces. It, it's kind of interesting uh, when we talk to clients about story and a half houses and we say, and they ask, well, you know, how, how, how high is that wall gonna be at the edge? Well, well I'm not, let's all say, well, you know, four feet or so, or maybe four feet four. And they say, oh my gosh, I can't walk up there. And then I kind of ask them, when's the last time you stepped up to a wall and stood against it? You know, it just doesn't happen that often, you know? So furniture placement really helps with that condition. A uh, little photograph here, you know, we tuck that little um, uh, closet door, uh, or I'm sorry, the bathroom door, very near to the, to the sloping edge, the underside of the rafters. And, you know, it's very comfortable. It's very, very comfortable, but it's hard to explain to, uh, to folks without them experiencing, experiencing it. Um, the next example that I'll go to is that kind of set aside stair. You know, this doesn't really qualify as a stair tower necessarily, but it's a stair hall. It's, a, it's, a, it's an independent roof that happens in a zone that allows you to get up and move through that, you know, moves through this, uh, the second floor and the roof line. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about this, the, well, let me, let's go, let's go backwards and say that the E front or that central stair that I showed earlier, one of the great things about that is it generally comes up kind of in the center of the building, which means that you can go, you can get up to the top of that guy and kind of go left and right or vice versa. Whereas when you come up at the end of a, we find that, you know, when you come up at the end, you have to figure what your way across the building to get to, you know, that other side, that other, that other usable area. 
Uh, so in this case, we try hard to you know, make that pathway across this attic area um, pleasant, useful, and wonderful, trying to avoid hallways or just use, you know, just, you know, kind of not in corridors as much as we can. So in this case, there's a nice little gallery that kind of happens that leads to a bedroom. Uh, and also, you know, the interesting question that also happens, you know, uh, another bedroom at the edge, but this is a kind of an unusual and not my favorite double shed dormer condition. You know, it's kind of interesting to have that, 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 that center void as opposed to the center occupied, you know, it's either the one or the three generally. Um, but this is yet another strategy that we'll utilize when, you know, the, 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 the context is appropriate and we can, um, uh, and, and works effectively to get the program to happen on that second floor. In this case, we needed this nice little common space. We needed two bedrooms, a couple of bathrooms. And you know, this is kind of the result of those. This is kind of the result. The result of those spaces. The stair hall could be really a beautiful place. Um, this, you know, that common area as opposed to a corridor creates a really delightful and usable area for that second floor. And then, uh, of course, you've got just the you know this great character of space in uh, those upper rooms, the attic, the attic areas. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but on each side, you know, there's this access to this incredible storage, which is one of the beautiful things about a, about a story and a half house. There's so very little waste. I mean, this house probably has about 60 square feet of, of, of unusable attic space. So that's a win on, you know, in, in, in my book, if you kind of look at that, that cubic foot of, um, of value, so the next example is, that I was referring to, well, you know, this is that interstitial space once again. So here, in fact, was a little gallery. You know, another strategy that we like to use is, well, okay, if you want to hold on to, you know, a if if the dormer configuration doesn't work very well, then how else can you use this space? And in this case, it became a wonderful little bunk, little bunk alcove which is right here in plan. So it was that, you know, that middle space between rooms that otherwise doesn't do a whole lot for you. Next example, which is the easiest or the lowest hanging fruit is the, you know, is the end uh, of the primary form stair. And the great benefit of this kind of plan is that, you know, unlike having a stair here in a small program, this stair at the end allows you to utilize, you know, keep all of this open and, and the flow from the flow from the main form through the back, which is kind of what happens here. And once again, when you come up to the top of the stair, you still have that notion of that issue of kind of working through that second floor to get the character of the elevation that you want, as well as the programmatic um, solutions. So, you know, stairs can be a very beautiful thing. Here's the example of, you know, allowing that central location or that uh, the end, the edge stair allows that central area to be open for other uses and to create kind of a great Now a center occupied, beautiful dormer of some, some sort and type. Um, Another example of the same edge stair is here, edge stair. Uh, in this case, when you get a little deeper and you get up to the top of the stair, you get the opportunity of getting rid of the corridor and, and have bedrooms front to back, which makes that really easy. It just takes a deeper, deeper main form, which is gonna be eh, 22, 24 feet, maybe 20. Uh, but it creates, you know, a really, you know, really wonderful opportunity. In this case, we've created it, got a, a nice little gallery area. So the example, you know, another kind of critical issue for us is how do you use that edge, make that, make that stair experience not only fun, but also uh, create something beautiful downstairs, open it up as much as you can. In this case, 
right above this area <clears throat> is a dormer and a gallery, which, which provides a lot of natural light down into, into the living space. And then, you know, the bedrooms are still a little bit more conventional. Um, <clears throat> The, along with the same exercise, a very small space is the notion of taking a little guest cottage and wrapping a tiny stair up the edge and working into a loft or a full second floor. But, you know, to me, it's always about finding that strategy to get up that, that will allow you to work within the, the program of the space that you need, as well as the architectural character. And, and you know that's kind of step one as as as, as we've found. And so as a presentation, you know, this is just a, an example of some of the things we do. But Q and A, I think, would be fun to to hear uh, others' uh, strategies uh, for you know for that vertical access and and whether or not they find it to be an issue, particularly on small small houses. Um, and with that. I think I'm going to say that's my 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Eric. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, questions for Eric? What are your thoughts on minimum stair width versus comfortable stair width versus maximum stair width? Yes. <laughs> um, it depends on the context. It, you know, it's always about context. So it's the scope of the house. Uh -oh. It's the scope of the house, I think, that drives that. You know, in that last example, that's a minimum, minimum, minimum stair that's three feet wide. Uh, and the stair hall, I mean, that thing was four feet wide. So there's somewhere in the middle, you know, for these small houses, it's not a grand stair in any case. But I, you know, our go-to, our go-to stair width is generally 42 inches. You know, I think that's a very comfortable um, width, but it is also dependent on whether it's a U-shape, whether it has walls on two sides, whether it's open on one side. So, you know, those are the things that we think about when we're looking at the, that, that width. I guess I always think about that king size mattress, right? <laughs> Thank you. Other questions from anyone? Eric, are most of your houses um, all stick framed or they, do you use any trusses in your attic spaces? We do primarily stick frame work, Jeffrey, but uh, we're doing you know, so much in Florida now and everything is truss built. So managing that becomes more of a challenge for sure. Uh, but you get through it. It just takes a lot more communication and, and a lot more clarity as to what your goals are and what, you know, so you saw you know, two or three building sections in these last houses. Well, it takes four or five or six or 12, you know, in the trust houses. <laughs> Eric, could you talk about who builds the stairs and are they built in the house or are they built in a shop and then installed in the house? Well, for, for, for this scale of house, I mean, you know, the largest house you saw there was 2,800, 3,000 square feet. So they are all uh, field framed and then finished on site. You know, when we get into the larger, more, you know, the grander manor houses, then we'll have stairs manufactured quite often. And if, you know, if, for instance, one of those set aside stairs, you know, let's say that we had a, you know, this beautiful, um, uh, a semicircle at the end that really wanted this sculptural curved stair, then, you know, that in that case, that would be shop built for sure. But most of ours are going to be field frame, Gary, just the scale of the house. And, and are they stock component stair pieces or are they custom? Both. You know, that's where we get some freedom because it's all... It's all on site, so it's, it, it, depends on the, it depends on the house. We'll design and custom build a lot of the balustrade uh, 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 and then otherwise we might just do some selecting. Okay. It depends on the ex 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 exposure too.
Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Eric uh, before we move on? You can always circle back. Okay. Oh, Gregory, are you asking a question? What are the R values for the roofs where you're working? Generally 30. We work a lot of different places, but in the zone that we live in, we, we work with a, uh, for the roofs generally an open cell uh, spray foam at 30. And they get you a two by 10? Yes. Can, you know, a lot of the stuff around here, I'm a Yankee, so you know, we do, um, we have our, 49 and you know if if I'm doing fiberglass that's a 16 inch space so it really um, adds a degree of difficulty to the stair issues we experienced that in Edmonton we did a, a full cottage court up there and you know with double roof and holy cow you're you know that was it was certainly the, an element element that um you had to design around the no question. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, thank you very much. I think we'll transition now and have Gary Brewer join us um, to keep the conversation going. Great. Great. Thanks, Leslie. And I'm um, Jennifer Fitzpatrick from our office, who is an architect. She's actually an alum of Notre Dame. And she's on the call with me. She works with me on many of the houses and she's going to help me with the slides. So Jen, can you open the? Yep, of course. Hi everyone. Yep. So what I'm showing is actually complementary to what Eric showed purely by accident. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the stairs, although that's a uh, you know whole different topic. I'm gonna talk mostly about the need to figure out how to fit um, a second floor in a roof. Uh, next. So uh, our office doesn't really do many houses. In fact, we've only done one house in a new urbanist community and that's the house at Seaside. Um, most of the houses that we do are in um, uh, sort of resort or uh, second home communities. And so I have far fewer houses than what most of you do. I mean, I sort of joke that Gary Justice probably has, does more house in one year, in one year, more houses in one year than I've done in sort of 25 or 30 years. Um, uh, next. <clears throat> so the, in these communities, the height that one can do is a function of the zoning. And in places where they're more enlightened, the height is not measured by um, a dimension from the ground level up to the ridge height, it's measured by a uh, number of floors. So I worked on a project in Villanova Heights, which is a uh, part of a historic district in the Riverdale section of the Bronx um, called Fieldston, where their height requirements were by floors. So for the houses that we do, they typically range in size from 4,500 square feet, you know, all the way up to 15,000 square feet. And we end up with clients who they want a lot of square footage. They want, and they are often concerned if something is in the roof about the head height. Um, so this is an example of one house that is two stories with a roof on top. Basically on the ground floor, it's all living, dining, um, family room. And then typically on the second floor, it's principal bedroom along with um, children's or guest bedrooms. Next. So here you can see just different sides of the house where it is uh, a full two stories um, where the roof is an additive piece on the top where you get incidental rooms, but it gives you all kinds of flexibility about how do you put the roof on the house um, because you don't really have to worry that much about what's going in the roof. You're, you're more worried about the composition of the gables and dormers. Uh, next, please. 
And we, we find this on other style houses. The last one I showed, you know, is a shingle style house. Here in the same development is a colonial revival house, which is a more boxy form, which is two full floors and a partially occupied roof with a few dormers on next. And then other sides of it that just show, you know, full two stories with a roof on top. Next. And then a third, we did uh, five or six houses in this development. And the third one that I'm showing you is, is what we call the French Normandy, um, where it's stone um, and brick with a Ludovici tile roof, um, sort of like the front of the house is an American four square. But again, it's two stories with a roof on top. Next. And here's another view of it from uh, the side. Uh, next. So the more difficult um, uh, way to plan a house, uh, next, is when the zoning gives you not a, the number of floors, but they give you the height from the ground level to the ridge. And it gets even more complicated when a house is not on a flat site, because you have to go through all this um, uh, you know, the gymnastics of figuring out the mean or the medium dimension as you go around the house. But what it leads you to do is you are then required to try to get the second floor, which typically has bedrooms, somehow fit within the roof of the house because the ridge line height typically tends to be 32, 35 feet. And so the planning of the second floor, next. And here is the side that faces the water, one story with uh, what we call an occupied roof. Next. So it'll, this is from the CD set, but this shows you how one is trying to figure out the head height issues when you put the bedrooms and the various other rooms in the second floor. Uh, next. And it really is a puzzle about roof design. I mean, when you study architecture in school, you never learn about houses and then you never learn about sloped roofs or to try to figure out how one might, you know, fit rooms in a roof and also provide windows. So this is the roof plan of that house. The red represents the second floor floor plate. And then it shows examples of a Dutch gambrel roof, which allows you the most head height um, in the second floor, but where you can get major windows into bedrooms and dormers for secondary rooms where you could get windows and head height, but maybe not as big of windows as you would have, say, in a gambrel. Uh, next, please. So here you can see, you know, the second floor essentially squeezed into the roof with bedrooms with windows, sitting rooms with bays, master bedroom, master bath. I mean, it really is a puzzle. Um, next, please. And as Eric said, we hear from clients when we are addressing this as a design problem that they're concerned about the ceiling height and also what we call the break point. And we typically show them photos of other houses that we've done. And the funny thing about it is that at the end of the project, once the house is built, we often hear them say, actually the rooms we like the best are the ones that are in the roof with shaped ceilings because they tend to be much more interesting than rooms that just have flat ceilings. So here you can see this roof in the principal bedroom is following the shape of the Dutch gambrel above. Next. Or this sitting room on the second floor um, is perpendicular to the Dutch gambrel, but we're able to grab some space above um, to have a shaped ceiling and a break point that's actually at a higher uh, point. Next, please. In some cases, the break point, depending on where you are in the gambrel, tends to be lower. And so here's a kid's bedroom that has a break point that's probably around 6'6", six, six, maybe 6'7", six, but you're able to rise up above that to um, uh, get a, additional ceiling height. Next. And then the biggest accomplishment of my entire career was that I was able to fit a three fixture bath in a dormer. 
Um, and so this is a little dormer uh, that faces the, the, end, the front of the house that has a Gothic style arched window with shutters and we squeeze the tub in and the vanity to the right and the toilet. Um, and when somebody goes into this room, they look at it and say, well, you know, it looks really great. We love the tile. You know, when I go into the room, I, what I think is, I can't believe we fit it in there. Next. So another example of planning rooms and a roof is a house we finished in Virginia. Next. And this is somewhat different because our client didn't like Dutch gambrels. And, you know, I find if you're from the Midwest, you associate Dutch gambrels with barns. And if you're from the Northeast, maybe you, you know, can make the stretch that it's part of the Dutch gambrel style of um, uh, houses. So in this case, we had roughly about a 35 foot ridge height. And so we, to get the head heights and the windows that we needed, we did an eave line between the, at the second floor. And then on the entry side, we punctuated the roof with a double gable. Um, and I've done a lot of double gables and people have told me, wow, that you really like the look of double gables. It really comes down to it's the best way in a roof beyond dormers in a sloped roof to get the most windows and head height space. Next. So here is the water side and you can see the gabled roof with the dormers that allow you to have uh, windows and head height in bedrooms. But in the main portion of the facade, um, you have a sitting room, you have a master bedroom and you have a master bathroom. Um, and another completely different topic is people want traditional houses we find, but they want windows to be as big as they can possibly be. Next. So here in this gabled roof um, and with the floor plan being so deep, we utilized a flat roof. And so sloping up to the uh, flat roof with the sloped roof forms allowed us to get more head height in the portion of the plan that was deeper. Um, and the red represents the second floor plate. Next. And then again, how the rooms are squeezed into the roof with the stair opening up to a sitting room, a master bedroom, a master bath, master dressing, his dressing, and then the kids' bedrooms along with a guest bedroom um, that is over the garage wing, so it requires steps down. Next. So in this case, um, in some conditions, we're able to have the break point higher. And this is the principal bedroom looking out to the beach that has a tray ceiling next. And then the second floor sitting room, again, with a, a higher break point um, because it is in the portion of the plan that has, or the roof that has the flat roof above it next. But some of the kids' bedrooms, which are in the wing, um, have shaped ceilings, but they have the break point at a lower level and or a lower height. And the, uh, the way to get windows we find into these sloped roofs is to provide dormers. Um, and that allows us to get um, a nice size window. And in many cases, we will do a window seat um, in those conditions. Next. So the last is a project that's in process. Um, next. And it's on Shelter Island, which is out in the Hamptons. And uh, this client has um, a very large site. I forget, it might have like four or five acres. Um, he owns a second house that is adjacent to uh, where he wants to build. And there is a height uh, requirement here of 35 feet. Um, it also has a sloped site and it's also a waterfront site. And the height limits we find in these locations are really to protect people who live in these locations because they're terrified of new houses being too tall and too big and too ugly. And so their strategy is, well, if we can make them as small as possible, or as low as possible, 
then ugly small is better than ugly big. Um, next, please. So this is a large house. It's about 13,000 square feet. It's for three generations of a family. This is the downhill side. So this is two stories with an occupied roof and the other is one story with an occupied roof. Next. So we require a variance of four foot three to get the ridge height at this level right here. And the variance took nine months of public meetings. Um, it happened during COVID, so all of these meetings were in Zoom, where I had to present to a board and I had to contest with or contend with, there's a Shelter Heights district nearby and they hired an attorney. And so it became, I think that there were four or five meetings um, and there was the back and forth between how high could it be and how did it work with their zoning which measures height, next please, by ridge height. But because it's a sloping site and you have to measure the height of the building and go through the mathematical equations, our project ended up being four foot two above the height limit. And we argued it from lots of different angles, um, mostly because it's such a big site and it's only visible from the water like why in the hell did anyone care how tall it was? Um, and we also showed them examples of the cherished houses in the community from the 1920s and earlier that were two stories with uh, a roof on top, like the first projects I showed, um, but it still took nine months to finally get the approval. Next. So these are the front elevation, one story with an occupied roof, and then the water elevation with two stories and an occupied roof, and then a pool to the left. Next. And the second floor plate um, is in red and is dotted, and the roof of the building is um, twin gables connected by a gable that goes in the opposite direction with dormers that are punctuate the roof for the rooms that need the windows on the second floor. Next. And on the second floor, it is really just a stair or an elevator bringing you up to two bedrooms with a private bath and then open to below for the living room. Next. So in one of the meetings, the, the attorney for the opposition said, why don't you just design a house to the height limit? And what, what could be so hard about that? And I explained to them, I said, well, your height limit isn't by stories, it's by dimension. And so it prevents maybe accidentally that um, one can't do a traditional house with a slope roof and it's easier to do a flat roofed modern house. And she said, well, I think that the flat roof modern houses are actually more typical of this area, which is a you know later development than the historic districts. So they said, come back and show us a house that fits under the height limit. So we came back and we showed them a modern house in the meeting. And when we did, everybody gasped. So this is the same house. Um, and we basically took the roof off and we turned it as all glass. And we said, here you go. We don't even need a variance we can get this approved as of right for 35 feet. But my guess is people in the community don't like it. I know my client doesn't like it. So I don't see why it's such a, a struggle to get um, an approved traditional house um, that requires a sort of four foot variance. Next. And we showed them in the meeting, the proposed design facing the water um, with the traditional house on the top which required a variance and what a modern house could do that didn't require variance that was under the 35 foot height limit. And oddly enough, in about a week, we got the variance to go for the traditional house with the ridge height uh, that we wanted. Um, and I think Jen, is this the last one? Yep, that's yeah. it. So um, that's the struggles that we seem to have associated with um, uh, 
you know, how to talk a house or a second floor into the roof of a house. And I, you know, as an architect, we're all looking at precedence. And, you know, until you approach a problem, you don't really understand what to look for. So when I, every time I look at a house now, and every time I look at a house on the second floor plan, I'm always looking at how did the architect deal with the roof and the ridge line and the dormers? Because to me, that's as important as, you know, a beautiful shingle detail or a, a charming little shutter design. So that's, that's it, Leslie. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, we have several hands that have flown up. Um, however, yeah. I didn't want to disrupt your presentation. Um, so I'm gonna invite Nathan to ask his first question and then uh, Patty is after Nathan. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Leslie. Uh, 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 one observation, then one question for Double Gable Gary. Um, the, uh, the observation is that essentially these regulations I think are best uh, understood is sort of the, like their uh, the dimensional one, dimensional ones are what I call Pecha Kucha re regulations. You know where you have Pecha Kucha, which limits presentations typically to about seven minutes, and it's generally geared toward the idea that most people aren't very good at presenting. And so that's sort of I, I loved your last slide. I think that should be shared far and wide to any municipality uh, that's thinking about dimensional regulations. So that's the observation. Um, the the the, uh, the question is, I really love your uh, East Beach house in Virginia Beach. And yep. uh, I was curious, what was the regulation that required you to think so much about what you could fit in the roof line? Was that dimensional or was it something else? It, it was dimensional. Um, and the for that house, um, say, and also the Quag house, um, is that house was a double lot. Um, and so in addition to the zoning ridge height regulation, there was also a coverage regulation. And the coverage regulation had to do with not only heated and cooled space, but it also had to do with garage space, porch space, hardscape, you know, walks. And, and the, I mean, I'm sure other people find this working with house clients you know, when they build a house, they want everything and the kitchen sink. And so we end up trying to give that to them. And when there's a coverage issue, for example, in the Virginia Beach house, we were like two feet short of the maximum. And so, you know, related to coverage and ridge height is the other challenge is how do you try to do a bigger house um, and not have it look so big. Um, and what I find is good about a one-story house with an occupied roof is that it helps to bring the scale of the house down because the eave height ends up looking like it's one story above grade. So that's an, an added advantage. Hey, Leslie, can I throw one thing in very quickly? Sure. Uh, Gary, your images and uh, presentation were exactly why I wanted to go first, but because I couldn't follow you. Well, you can thank you can thank Jen for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the one thing we didn't talk about in uh, in either of our presentations is egress issues, because with story and a half houses, particularly when you get to the larger houses, yeah. egress issues from those middle those middle spaces become you know a pretty big pretty big issue right yeah. how do you how do you do that so i'm done that was just i wanted to bring that into the conversation as well because it's it, it is in fact a uh, a consideration with any of the uh, story and a half houses yeah well it affects i mean i find it affects window sizes and the other issue along what you're saying eric is that there are some places in their effort to control the sizes of houses, they have zoning regulations that limit the number of rooms one can have without a window. Um, and so in places in Connecticut, you can't do a powder room or a bathroom unless it's on the exterior wall. 
And, and, and if that first floor is too much bigger than the second floor, that dormer can get very long yeah. or you've got to, you know, you've got to work with, you know, incantations of that roof in order to get egress windows to work, which is, you know, it's a deal. Yeah, yeah. That's it, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, first, I'm in a much better mood. <laughs> Hearing the, the trouble that you've had, Gary, because as I think you know, I've been uh, living in the uh, river towns where there is no large print that the small print can't take it away. Um, every time there's a zoning change, it's basically trying to make it uh, more difficult really to do the quality of houses that people enjoy the most in the area, which is baffling, but I know that from the Hamptons as well. Um, uh, one just quick, what we did, what Irvington uh, changed their zoning height to be 35 feet from the lowest point of grade, either before or after construction, whichever was lowest, to the ridge of the house to 35 feet. And in Irvington, you've got lots of hills. So we were the first house coming before them. Um, we designed the kind of houses that we've been doing, which are, you know, they're, they aspire to what you're doing, although we um, seldom achieve the perfection that I think some of your houses have. Um, when we walked in with a house that was over their newly adopted height, um, they were basically just taking the position where you're going to have to redesign this and get it down. I said, well, not actually. All we need to do is remove the roof. So they said, oh, well, okay, come in to the next meeting and show us what that looked like. We took, we did not change the design of the house. We had the first floor and the second floor, the, all the trim details, everything were the same. We just cut the top of the house off and said, it's a flat roof and we're now compliant. And they, they, tried, they kept trying to get us to break and, and claim that we were just kidding. And I said, no, we'll build it. And I said, well, yeah, but it's going to look awful. And I said, yeah, and then everybody's going to complain about it. And then we'll build the roof so it'll look good. So they actually changed, we got them to change the code, although marginally, but just enough. Um, one question, when you were looking at the Virginia Beach House, and it almost looked like you did it on the Shelter Island House, when you end up with a flat roof on top, um, have you experimented with the idea of actually going up and making it the widow's walk? Because whenever I'm doing a flat roof, I always figure I've got the challenge of, you know, everybody says it's going to leak. So I want to get something for the fact it's going to leak. And getting up onto that roof on uh, Virginia Beach, I just think would be amazing. Yeah, well, the Virginia Beach house didn't have a widow's walk, but um, um, maybe you asked this question to just make me feel even worse because on the, <laughs> on the house in, in <clears throat> Elder Island, we had proposed as part of the design because our client has, he's quite an avid boater and he has a really beautiful, expensive boat we proposed to have a widow's walk on top of that, which started an ongoing debate with the variance board and the Shelter Heights district about does that qualify as being part of the height? And we had to go through the zoning code and say, well, actually it qualifies as a protuberance and it's an open handrail. And we had on top of the widow's walk, we had a, um, a flagpole. And then the woman attorney from Shelter Island said, well, that qualifies as an occupiable space where somebody's going to take a lawn chair up there. And I said, well, there's not even really a stair, there's a ladder and we're doing it for the look. So we came back to the next meeting and we said, we lowered the handrail. And they also said there is a code issue that the handrail has to be three foot six. And we did with our code consultant, we found out it didn't because it didn't qualify as occupiable. And so we lowered the rail down to 2.0 and we took the flat floor and we did it as a sloped, you know, uh, like this to show that nobody could really even sit up there. And as part of the approval, the one thing that the Heights District got is they got the variance board to get rid of the widow's walk. And so it was just, it was absurd. And we showed examples of widow's walks that were done on the historic houses. You know, so it doesn't become, it isn't really a, it isn't people looking at something from a design perspective. We find that people on the boards are more interested in 
are we setting a variance that is going to cause us headaches in the future um, that we're going to regret? Um, and and, the, and it, you know that's kind of what it comes all down to. Yeah, it's it's the, very difficult at times. Yeah. Um, other questions for Gary? I um, accidentally muted Eric Moser if you need to be back on, sorry. <laughs> I mean, the thing, the thing I'd like to say in closing is that like in the group with the Guild and the CNU, um, it always seems like there's, there's kind of an attitude that our office, you know, maybe because of the sizes of the houses or the budgets, that somehow we aren't dealing with the same problems that everybody else is dealing with. And, and you know, the more I hear from other architects that do work at new urbanist communities, you know, I think that independent of budget um, or house size or where you're building, I think that we're all kind of dealing with the, you know, the same kind of problems. And so I think to have an event, you know, like this where we're talking about, you know, the planning issues, for example, how to fit rooms on a second floor roof, I. I think it's interesting to not only look at other people's plans, but to hear, you know, their stories and the things that they're, you know, working um, through as they design the houses that they're doing. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, on behalf of the Guild, we appreciate your generosity and time today, as well as Eric Moser for being with us. Um, Jeff Moen, as you see, is on the call. The idea of this, which the genesis again a lot is credited to Gary was to do um, brief presentations and then have this Q&A so um, we appreciate you all being with us in this more informal guild hour. Um, I do want to say a quick welcome to Stephanie Bothwell who joined us um, this this, um, this afternoon and to once again thank all of you for being here we are going to continue to do these types of pop-up events and then we also have the more scheduled, um, what we call live at the Guild webinars, which will be rolling out our schedule for the remainder of the year. And of course, I wanna say a quick plug to all of you who are likely already attending CNU 29 virtually next week. Um, we have several, seven Guild sessions uh, from many of our members are participating throughout the program next week, which primarily starts on Wednesday um, but there are some pre-events that begin, I believe, even on Monday. So we encourage all of you to participate as you can. And if you have any final questions before we close, um, I want to say a big thank you for your time and especially to Gary and Eric for joining us. Great. Thanks, Leslie.